Hello, I'm Vanessa Jacoby. I'm an obstetrician and gynecologist and clinical researcher here at the University of California, San Francisco. I'm really excited to discuss today's topic, which is how to design a research question for your research project. And the research question is really the foundation for designing and implementing a clinical study. It really serves as the starting off point for developing the entire project. And it can focus the investigator and the study team on the key scientific issues. And then it's your launching off point to develop the entire study protocol. And the protocol is the roadmap for how to conduct the study. In this class, you'll develop a study protocol from start to finish. And the research question is the foundation of that study protocol. So here's a research question that I've been thinking about recently. In the last six months, I have noticed a lot of people wearing tech devices. So I've seen people wearing them as glasses. I've seen them as uh, wristbands. I've seen them even as gloves. And these tech devices, many of them emit non-ionizing radio frequency energy, and people are wearing them all day long. So a research question I've been thinking about is, are wearable tech devices safe? So how does this look as a research question? Well, on the one hand, it's good because it seems timely. It's a new and emerging technology. Um, probably there aren't a lot of studies done about this particular topic, and it may have some significant health consequences to a large population worldwide. But on the other hand, it's extremely broad and not specific. So it doesn't convey a particular, particular issue of concern. So for instance, what possible unsafe outcomes am I thinking about? What tech devices am I thinking about? What population is this important in? Am I going to um, be concerned about the possible exposure in? So it's uh, interesting and exciting, but it's certainly extremely broad. So we are going to discuss how you can transform this type of idea that is exciting and novel into a very efficient, high-impact research question. And specifically, the objectives of this lesson are to understand how to derive a good research question, and to be able to explain the three key components to the research question, and to name and describe the FINER criteria, which is an acronym so for some key ingredients that we evaluate research projects and research questions that I'll describe. So first, how do you derive a good research question? Where do these research questions come from? Well, the first starting off place is, of course, to just pick a topic of interest to you. And this may be in your field of expertise or perhaps in your mentor's field of expertise. A lot of people start with a very broad topic, for instance, heart disease. So this is a very important topic, has, uh, impacts a very large population, but it's extremely broad. So one of the first steps in developing a research question is to narrow down your topic area. And one way to do that is to focus on a specific aspect within this broad topic. So for instance, you might decide to focus on screening for a condition or treatment for the condition or developing tests or systems for making a prognosis for the condition. Or perhaps you want to focus on health policy related to the condition. But narrowing down the scope of the content area is a really good first step for developing a research question. So once you've connected with your topic of interest, the next step is to do an extremely thorough literature review. So here you really want to immerse yourself in journals, in abstracts, in proceedings of meetings perhaps related to this topic. And there are a few themes that you're looking for. First, you want to focus on reading about the latest developments in the field so you really understand the emerging topics that are relevant to your research question. 
You also want to look for possible points of controversy because those might be areas that are very ripe for good research qu questions. And one place that you can sometimes find areas of controversy are in the editorials that are published along with a publication. So um, also in proceedings of meetings, sometimes there are points of controversy highlighted. You want to look for gaps in knowledge where a new study would be able to fill in and advance science in that area. And when you're doing this literature review, I recommend that you be skeptical, even about some long-standing dogma sometimes, because a new eye, a fresh perspective, can sometimes really um, question even old dogma and advance and move science forward in your field. When you're doing the literature review, also remember to be organized about collecting and storing the citations in some type of software program that you can use. Um, this will make things a lot easier when you go to write the protocol, when you write grants and publications related to this topic. When you do your initial research review, having a very organized, systematic way to store the citations is extremely important. After the literature review, the next step is really to get input from your mentor. So developing a research question is an extremely iterative process. You probably will not end the, uh, your ending research question will not be what you started with. You want to make it evolve and improve after getting input from your colleagues and particularly your mentor. So your mentor can really help guide and inform the development of the research question and also the development of the entire research study. So choosing a mentor is an extremely important decision for your research career. I want to take a moment to discuss some of the qualities that you could use to look for an appropriate good mentor for a research project. So the first is the mentor should have expertise. Now sometimes that expertise is really in your field of interest, in your content area, but it may be that the mentor has expertise in not your content area, but a design that you'll use. So for instance, if you're studying heart disease and you want to do a randomized trial and you have a mentor who studies pulmonary disease but has a lot of experience with designing and implementing randomized trials, that might be a good fit because the study design, a randomized trial, and expertise in that area could be very helpful to you in implementing studies of heart disease. The second quality is you want to try to assess um, that the mentor is committed to your success. One way you can do that is see if this person has mentored other people and have the other mentees been successful in advancing their career or pursuing research or getting funding for research in the way that you want to be able to? And that you feel that the mentor in discussing and meeting with them is really committed to you and your success. And the third characteristic of a really good mentor is someone who's approachable and available. So, do you feel comfortable talking to them? Are you able to easily communicate with them? Do they respond to your communication requests, like email, in a timely fashion? Are they willing to meet with you on a regular basis, especially during this class where you'll want to get a lot of input as you design your study protocol? Can they commit to some regular meeting times? Those are some of the important characteristics of a mentor and going to them in discussing the research question and the research project and getting input and then reformulating based on their input or in discussion with them is a really key part of designing a research question. A few other things that a mentor can do to assist you is they really can provide support when you meet obstacles or challenges during your research, which we all do. A mentor also can um, connect you with potential collaborators who can help with your research. And a mentor also may be able to connect you with an existing database that they have or an existing patient population that they've collected some data on. Especially when you're starting out in research, those types of relationships can be 
extremely, extremely important. So spend some time to be able to identify and choose a mentor who is a good fit for you in developing your research, questioning your research project. The last step in developing a research question is to be sure that you feel committed and enthusiastic to this research question. So after discussing with your mentor and trying to fine tune and improve and make more efficient and high impact the research question, you wanna look at it and feel very enthusiastic, very um, excited to start the project. And that will help you a lot first to manage challenges. So as I said, we all meet obstacles, difficult times, challenges during research. And if you feel really passionate and committed and enthusiastic about the topic, that will serve to help you move through some of these challenging times. And it can also really fuel the endurance with this topic because most research studies take many years to implement, to complete, to do analysis on, to write publications about, and to help move science forward. So having that enthusiasm and feeling that this is really important to your field and this will improve health is really important even at the early stages. Okay, so now I'll review how to write the research question. There are really three elements to writing a research question. The first is the predictor or the independent variable, which is the intervention that you're going to use in the study. So for a trial, that might be the medication you're gonna test, the surgery or the procedure that you're going to perform. That's the predictor. In a observational study, an epidemiologic study, that might be the risk factor that you're interested in. But those are the independent variables or the predictors, which are named in the research question. The second element is the outcome or the dependent variable. And the outcome is what is the effect of the predictor? What's the consequence or the result of the in intervention that you'll be administering? That's the outcome. And then the third component is the study population. What group will you observe for this study? Are these children? Are these adults? Are they with disease, without disease? These are the three components that you want to include in the research question. You then take those components and put them in a fairly predictable order that looks like this. Does the predictor cause the outcome among the study population? This is a good example for an interventional study like a randomized trial. You may want to alter it slightly if you're doing um, an observational study looking for associations and perhaps not as focused on direct causality. So you might say, is the predictor associated with the outcome among the study population? So let's look at some examples of how to develop these research question with those three components. Now, when you're writing the question, there's a few characteristics that you wanna focus on. So the first is that you really want to phrase this as a question. A lot of students, when they're beginning, will write a statement as the research question. Please end this sentence in a question mark and create it as a question. You want to make the research question really clear. Does the investigator in the research question clearly state what you want to learn, what you want to resolve, what you're going to study? You want to be succinct. And you wanna make sure the research question is really focused. Does it really pinpoint precisely what you want to study, what you want to discover during this project? So take those characteristics, use the three elements that we just discussed, and write the research question. Let's look at some examples. So this is an example um, of a colleague of mine who was very interested in whether the levonorgestrel intrauterine system could decrease heavy menstrual bleeding in women with uterine fibroids. So fibroids are extremely common non-cancerous tumors in the uterus and they can cause very, very heavy menstrual bleeding. The levonorgestrel intrauterine system has a slow release of 
levonorgestrel, which is a progestin that thins the lining of the uterus and can significantly decrease menstrual bleeding. But this device hadn't been studied a lot in women with fibroids, and so she was interested in whether this could help women with fibroids decrease menstrual bleeding. So she came up with a research question, and here was the first try. Does the levonorgestrel intrauterine system impact bleeding for fibroids? So let's look at this question. First of all, we can identify the predictor here. It's the levonorgestrel intrauterine system. And then let's look for the outcome. Well, it looks like the outcome is bleeding. But the problem with this research question is that the outcome is not focused. It's not clear which way do you think the bleeding will go, worse, better, and what type of bleeding? Is this menstrual bleeding? Is this bleeding anytime? And the other problem with this research question is that it doesn't have a study population. So here's the second try on this research question. Does the levonorgestrel intrauterine system decrease menstrual bleeding among women with fibroids? So this is a better research question. First, you can identify the predictor here in green, and then you can more clearly see the outcome of interest, which is decreased menstrual bleeding. So that's much more focused and clear than previously in the research question. And then she's added the study population, women with fibroids. So this is a very nicely crafted research question. However, when she discussed the design of the research question with her mentor, she realized that she probably was gonna do this as a randomized trial, comparing women who had the levonorgestrel intrauterine system with women who got oral contraceptives for heavy bleeding. So in that type of study, where you're comparing two interventions, such as a randomized trial, you might wanna also consider adding the comparison group into the research question to be very clear and very focused and here's the final research question. Does the levonorgestrel intrauterine system decrease menstrual bleeding compared with oral contraceptive pills among women with uterine fibroids? So you can see here it has the three components that we've discussed. It's very succinct, it's focused, it's clear. This is a nicely written research question. Let's look at another example. So I had a student in a research course who was very interested in these automatic external defibrillators that are in a lot of airports and now more and more public places. And these are devices that you probably have seen before that say AED, usually with a big red heart on the front. And the idea of these devices is that when someone has sudden cardiac arrest, placement of the device and use of the device is supposed to prevent death. So this has not been studied very well, and um, this student was very interested in the association of AEDs with sudden cardiac arrest. So here's a first try of the research question. Do AEDs in airports prevent sudden cardiac arrest? Well, let's look for the three components. Where is the predictor? that's very clearly identified. AEDs in airports is the predictor in this study. And where's the outcome? Well, on first glance, the student felt that the outcome was sudden cardiac arrest. But when we discussed it in our research course, he realized that, in fact, sudden cardiac arrest was not the outcome. The outcome that the AEDs were trying to prevent was death following sudden cardiac arrest. You'll also see in this research question that there's no study population, so it's not as clear and focused as it could be. So the student then went and did a second attempt at the research question, which looked like this. Do AEDs decrease the risk of death among adults with sudden cardiac arrest in airports? Now this is a much better research question. Here we have the predictor in green, the outcome, which now is clearly defined as the risk of death, and the study population, adults with sudden cardiac arrest in airports. So this is a well-crafted research question with the three components that's succinct, clear, and focused. 
And here's another example. This was a student who was interested in how diet is associated with the development of dementia, or not associated with the development of dementia. And so this is, uh, was a prospective cohort study of older adults looking for associations between what they ate and the development of dementia. And the research question that this student presented was this. Is a high-fat diet associated with development of dementia among adults older than 65? This was the first attempt at her research question, and this was a really well-crafted, nice research question. It has the predictor identified, the outcome in yellow, the patient, the, sorry, the study population in blue. So this is a great first attempt at a research question. Finally, I want to review five criteria that we use frequently to evaluate a research study and to evaluate a research question. A lot of these criteria are also used by decision makers who review grants or publications in thinking about the impact of your study. So these are some of the key items to consider when you're developing the research question and thinking about the study and the research protocol. This is an acronym, FINER, which stands for the five criteria. So the first criteria is feasibility. This is extremely important for new investigators. You want to know when you're designing the study whether it's feasible to do. Do you have the resources? Do you have the time? Do you have the funding to actually conduct the study that you're planning? The second criteria is, is this study interesting? So is this study intriguing to your colleagues, to your mentors, and to you? Is this a topic that is, um, will grab them and engage them and excite them about the impact that this will have on science? The third criteria is novel. So is this study a new idea? Is it innovative? Or is this a new approach to an existing idea? Is this an attempt to refute an existing idea? Is this um, a new population that's critical to study and intervention in? So that's the definitions of novel, which is a key component in evaluating a research study. The fourth is, is the study ethical? So does the study abide by the principles of medical ethics and research ethics that will be outlined in a separate lecture during this course? Will this study be compatible with the guidelines and regulations of your institutional review board? Will this study minimize the harm to study participants? And finally, is the study relevant? Is this study going to have a major impact on the field of science? Is this study going to move forward your field and have a significant impact on the health of the population that you're studying? Is this study relevant? So the finer criteria should be applied to all studies at the initial planning phase and apply them to your research question as well. So in summary, research questions are extremely important because they guide the protocol development, and the protocol is the roadmap for implementing the entire study. So spending a good amount of time on the research question and thinking about the components and how it will serve as the outline for your entire study is very critical. Second, designing the research question is a really iterative process. So write a research question down and then think about the three components, the planning of the study, talk to your mentors, and then rewrite it, make it better, improve it. Or as you're designing the protocol, if things change and you need to readjust the research question, that's okay. It's an iterative process. And finally, make sure that you get a lot of input and support from your colleagues and mentors, because those relationships will improve the research question, improve your research study, and are also really fun, enjoyable connections to make during this course and during your research. We really look forward to reading your research questions this week 
and seeing all of the interesting studies that you're planning. Thank you.